Hi there, I'm Jonathan Fields, and this is Good Life Project. So my guest today is Jasmine Solano, and Jasmine is a DJ, a rapper, a music producer, a spokesperson, a blogger, a global jet setter and trendsetter, and a business builder. She's doing some really incredibly empowering things in the world and really building it around her passion. So I'm really excited to have this conversation. So awesome to be hanging out with you today. Thank you. When uh, when I, I was first exposed to your work through a, a mutual friend of ours, I, I started reading about who you were and what you're doing. I'm like, oh, this and that. Oh, and she does this and this and this. You are sort of like surrounded and you're in this incredibly white hot world. Mm. The first thing that really stands out is is the word DJ. And it's funny, you know, we, we talked about the fact that you know, in, in a lifetime ago, back in college, I was a club DJ, and it, that meant I was just the guy behind the tables, you know, <laughs> spinning records. Now, wh when we talk about DJs, I mean, these are like people who run massive parties, conferences, like you're yeah. a celebrity in your own right. Mm -hmm. So, but I think in your world, you get that, but a lot of people who are gonna be watching this are, are really gonna have no exposure. So tell me what, that life is like, what that lifestyle is like. I mean, sort of fill in the gaps here. What yeah, well, the evolution of DJing, like you said, in the past 15 years has gone from someone who needed to rehearse in their basement every day for at least two years before they could even step out to DJ, to now anyone with an iPod can, you know, go from a playlist and call themselves a DJ. So you have a really wide gap today. And a lot of people see the, the whole range, like whether they're going to a festival, a party, um, a night out, they'll see that whole range. And um, what's cool is that where I fit in is kind of, I came from the, the vinyl generation. And so I bought my first pair of Technique turntables when I was 18. I was trying to mix like Mozart and dance hall. I was trying to do all this weird stuff, you know, yeah. at a really young age. I was studying turntablists, people that literally know how to use the turntables as instruments. And um, then when I started to really DJ out, because I started DJing on the radio when I was 17, which was different. It was more like learning how to connect with an audience that you can't see, learning to um, set a vibe, set a mood, and create a story. Whereas DJing out in the club is to me, it's music anthropology, hmm. you know? Um, you have to really be open to people. You have to learn how to connect with them. And if they're not moving and they're not laughing and smiling, you're not doing a good job. And it's a selfless act. I mean, I will talk on the mic during my DJ sets, but not often. Sometimes I just like to have this quiet exchange where what I play is my communication to the audience. So, so. I started to come up in the digital age with Serato, which is a digital DJ software program, mm -hmm. which is extremely similar to vinyl, sort of, but it just, uh, it's done digitally, which I can explain, you know, later. Yeah, and we're later. actually gonna play around with yes, yeah, some equipment later, some so stuff. we can actually get hands on. Right. Um, when you started out, I mean, we're, so right now, when I think about some like huge name DJs, I, I mm -hmm. think about you know, tens of thousands of people all yep. vibing these massive events. Yeah. When, when you were starting out, mm -hmm. did you have your eye on that? And you're starting to build this reputation on that level mm -hmm. now. Is that where, where you were thinking about or? Yeah, because you know, um, the DJs that I admired growing up were DJ Qbert, DJ Shadow. These are, um, you know, original old school DJs that were kind of the first turntablists. And they would win these DMC con contests. You'd have world world championship contests between DJs, you know, in like the late 90s. And the, the person who would win would be like the best DJ in the world. Uh -huh. And they would have thousands and thousands of people come to just see them do like a five minute set. So, you know, even then, like I was, I was definitely one of those fans that was looking at those those top DJs in the world. Today you have Skrillex or Diplo, right. Tiesto, um, you know, mainly electronic DJs that are really like bringing back the whole rave scene, bringing back th that electronic music festival experience, so. Yeah, and, and to me, I mean, Skrillex is one that like sort of, I think is probably most cross generation where yeah. everybody kind of knows about him and dubstep. And, yeah. Um, but what's, what's so cool is, is that now it's like the DJs are huge celebrities themselves. Yeah, Where it used God. to be, okay, you got a DJ <laughs> and they're sort of like backing up or they're with mm -hmm. other people. But now it's like the focus is all on you. Totally, um, yeah. I mean, what do you think is behind that evolution? 
I think that, I think the art of DJing, which I get into a lot of conversations about this, has kind of reached its shining moment because to, there's so much to DJing. People think it's just playing music, but how fast you're mixing the records, what the records are, the BPM switching, the crowd that knows, you know, references versus n like no references, the top songs in the world at the moment, um, what the trends are. Like it's, there's so much, like I said, anthropology that goes into playing like the ultimate DJ set. And I think that there are certain people in the world like Skrillex who have learned all of that, like just ahead of the curve that they can blow up and attract all these fans who are, who he just nailed the formula. Right. And DJing is about nailing a formula. Hmm. So what's the difference in between nailing the formula and where's, and the craft, mm -hmm. you know, cause you just named out a whole bunch of different elements. Right. And I'm, I'm guessing it takes probably years and years and thousands of hours of practice yeah. to get really good at that. So how much of it is sort of like, okay, this is the formula that makes you go boom right? and just craft and practice, practice. The craft, I think the craft is practicing the formula a thousand times. You know, you can be in your room and think of all those things I just listed and come up with a great DJ set. You go into a club, you have 500 people in front of you you may choke, you may um, not blend a record right, you may forget everything you were thinking of, the nerves of everything. You know, it takes years to get those nerves to calm down. It's like any sport. Right. Like the more you do it, the more you learn how to stay calm and get into your zone quick and control the emotions, the better you'll be. And that's kind of where the craft comes from, right. you know? So for you, when you step into what, what makes you feel that, I mean, do you still feel mm -hmm. that every time or have you sort of reached a certain level like, where you know there's something new where if you step in front of a room of 10,000 people or something like yeah. that or 5,000 what is it for you that um, actually makes it's that funny happen I DJed for uh, Target's first Saturdays at the Brooklyn Museum this summer and there was 10,000 people outside and you know I live in Brooklyn I lived in Brooklyn for a long time and I respect Brooklyn and so you know I'm like I cannot mess up one second in Gotta front of this crowd because right. they will just throw tomatoes in my face and I was so nervous that I could barely look up. And then there's some moments where like, I'm not nervous at all. Like there, you know, I, I know I can kill it. I go in and we have a great time. So it, if, I, if I respect the gig and respect the audience, that's where the nerves kind of come in. So I still get nervous, but my, my trick, I guess, to kind of get into the zone is to just kind of hone in on the music and try to dance. Like if you're really stiff, you're, you'll get like, it'll be like really, your body will be tight and you won't be relaxed. But if you can kind of dance with the music and, and just let your body calm down, it's a better way to get in the zone. Right. So when you go to that place where you're up there and you've got all of these things flying through your head and all the different elements that you're trying to vibe together, where's the line between performance and conversation in this? Hmm. With DJing, they're combined because you are having a conversation without talking. So your performance is your conversation, so to speak. Like everything you drop and the way you drop it is going to be a conversation to the audience. And they're either gonna react and be like, oh, oh my God, or they're just gonna kind of be like, yeah, you know, that's cool. And so that's what is so neat about DJing is that it's a constant conversation, but no one's talking to each other. It's strictly through music and body movement. Yeah, I mean, and it's, I mean, again, I'll, I'll bring it back to my, the only experience I know, which is this small fraction uh -huh. of what sort of what you're doing. But I remember being in a club late at night, and you know, it's one in the morning and there are hundreds of people around, and you know that the choice that you're making at any given moment will radically change the energy of the entire club. Yeah. You know, and, and that you have to, for me, it was always so fascinating in that observation was such a huge part of it. And mm -hmm. you can come in with a plan of what you want to play, or you've been like working certain transitions mm -hmm. or certain pieces together, and you're really excited to do that. And like you start doing it, you start going with sort of like what you want to do. And mm -hmm. then you're looking around, and you're like, this isn't working. Yeah. Um, and then you have to just freestyle. <laughs> exactly. And that takes that takes the talent. That's kind of where the talent kicks in. Like, do you have the musical background to know what you could change up that might work? Do you have even the sense to observe that it's not working? Like, do you, do you have all those things that make a great DJ? And that's, that happens all the time. People could be loving it for five minutes and then they stop dancing and you have to 
figure out what's gonna work. Yeah. So, um, so how do you handle that? <laughs> I mean, do you vibe off of that? Is it a natural adrenaline rush for you, or is it something that you kind of work, learn to work with? It's definitely an adrenaline rush that I enjoy. I've been pretty successful at it, which is what makes me think I can keep doing it. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, one thing about me is that um, one thing I did was I traveled around the world to about ten different countries and studied each country and then went into the country and um, one of my major classes was studying the music and the music culture in each country so I would go to the local record shop or try to go to like a local club and and find like the music and then I, I made this whole project around it and it was a couple of years ago so things have changed but I've always had that interest of learning about people and learning about culture and learning how music affects people. So that's always kind of been my MO. So you put that into the DJing and you have like a musical anthropologist. Yeah, so what's in the thus, club. thus the term, <laughs> right? You were talking about also that the way that you break in um, were sort of like battles. Mm -hmm. Tell, describe that whole thing. Like, what's that about? <laughs> I mean, and, I don't and like, is it still like that, or is was that sort of like how it was in the nineties and the early? There are still contests. There are still battles. Red Bull does a lot of contests, um, and I was actually in a contest for rapping that Budweiser threw in two thousand nine called Battle for the Crown, and I I won that. It was me versus eight guys, and I won that off of a freestyle. This is rapping. This is you know different, but um, but that's the only battle that I was really in. And I'm not really into the, I'm not really into the competing side of it. Like a lot of people treat it like a sport, and I kind of treat it like uh, my passion. Mm, so you know it's more I mean? art for you than yeah, uh, sport. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right. So, so two things that you just brought up that I wanted to talk about. Trying to figure out what to do first. Um, <laughs> One, uh, I'm, well, rapping is this whole other thing. I want to explore that a little bit. But you said you're one woman in this contest of was eight other men. Mm -hmm. What's the, in terms of like the bigger sort of like world of DJing and like sort of like bringing music to people on that level? Mm -hmm. Is there a big divide between men and women? Is it all men? Is it all women? Or are you sort of like a real standout or are there a lot of women in yeah. doing this now? It's definitely male dominated. Hip hop, um, DJing, definitely male dominated. Um, I don't know where to start in this. So, you know, I think from a young age, I was always kind of hanging out with the guys, always like competing with the guys. Um, just kind of enjoyed that. I liked guy stuff. I liked nerdy guy stuff, you know? And um, that has kind of carried on throughout my life, just hanging out with punk rockers, skaters, hip hop heads, reggae, you know, reggae Jamaicans, you know, just always kind of in like that in like a boy crew and so it was easy to kind of join the boys club when mm. it came to DJing and hip-hop I, I just kind of felt like I fit in but that's not to say that I encounter double standards all the time um, being a female DJ you stand out and it may be a bonus for some people when they want to book eye candy but you have to be that much better at your craft each time because people aren't necessarily expecting you to be good They're expecting you to look good and so that's super important to me that every time I leave a gig they're like okay she she knows what she's doing or she's about her business you know and that's paid off in having that type of standard that I set for myself um, rapping same thing not a lot of female rappers nowadays they're way more accepted um, there's a ton of girls that have been recently signed and are touring and and all that stuff. So it's definitely um, it's like it's it's a double-edged sword. Like you have an advantage in a sense, but you also you also have a lot of stereotypes already on you right. before you even step on the stage. And imagine like when, once you get in the door, I mean, yeah, you, know, you hate to think that people are hiring just because you may have a certain look. Mm -hmm. But if you have a certain look that gets you in the door. Once you're playing music, like mm -hmm. once you once you're sitting there and there's, you know, there's a pulse of, of humanity in front of you. Yeah, it's up to whether you're good or bad. Absolutely. You know, it's like if you don't deliver the goods after that, okay, then it's really You'll never get hired it's about again. the craft. Yeah. So, um, so have you felt like you've had to work harder or different or in a different way at all because you're a woman in a male dominated field, or it's or it's not really been so much? No, of an issue. because unfortunately, I'm already a workaholic, and so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
<laughs> so you the, couldn't possibly work harder. So it just it just worked out, you yeah. know, like the the um, you know I'm really close with my parents, and they always taught me to be um, a good person and to go for respect above all, and that definitely was ingrained in me, and so. I knew that music was gonna be everything around like 15, 16. And so from there, every decision I've made has been, you know, in conjunction with a musical life and also having this background of like, I'm gonna do this right, I'm gonna do this well, and I'm gonna really do it. You know? so, so take me back to that place when you were 15 or 16 or when you started to realize, okay, this is, this is something bigger than just a passing interest. Mm -hmm. What was it that drew you to, I mean, maybe not DJing, but at first, mm -hmm. but saying music needs to be a really big part of what I do? You know, that's a time in my life that I think about a lot, like 15, 16, 17. Um, it was a time in my life that I was completely free creatively. I think it's because, you know, you're in high school, you're not paying rent, you're not paying your car insurance. You can kind of just live for the moment and your hormones are crazy, so everything just feels 10 times greater than it is. But at that time, um, I started to, I would, I was never in band, but I was really cool with the band teacher. He would let me use the band room after school when they weren't using it. And I would get my friend who was a drummer and my friend who was a beatboxer. And we would go in and freestyle these medleys where I would sing, I would rap, I would do spoken word. And I'd cover all the music that I loved at the time, which was a range from like Janis Joplin to Lauryn Hill. Mm. Like I was, I was a little hip hop activist. Kinda. Right. So where was this, by the way? This was in Philly. Okay. I went to high school um, in Doylestown, outside of Philly. Yeah. But sure. I'm from Northeast Philly originally. So we're doing these um, freestyles. We go perform them at open mics. Um, on top of that, I'm I start dancing in this break dance club, and I'm on this like hip hop dance squad. And then I decide that I'm going to put on these hip hop political events hmm. in this little hippie town, and. I talked to the, the courthouse. This, this was in Doylestown at yeah, the point? Yes, I know Doylestown. You do? Oh yeah, I know Doylestown. It's, you... it's not exactly the most, yeah. Yeah, no, it's like a super hippie. Right. Um, but it was at a time where like, kids were squatting in Doylestown and like, I was hanging out with the hippies, swimming in the rivers, like I was all over the place. Um, well, that's another thing, but I had, <laughs> I had this like city background and then moved out there and got this hippie influence. So that's right. kind of where that, that comes from. Anyway, I decided to put on these hip hop political fusion events where I'm having punk rock bands play, hip hop kids. I put on a multimedia presentation of like against the war. I have Green Party representatives. This is all at like 16. So I, I designed the flyer. Like I'm, I'm starting to realize that like I love producing. I love things that involve music. I love sending a message. And apparently you're not afraid of taking action. I mean, no. I'm just saying, at 16 years old, you're putting together events with all these moving pieces. Yeah. Um, you just dive headlong into it. That yeah. Would, that would terrify most adults, let alone most 16 year old kids. Yeah, I mean, now my political views are a little broader, but, uh, but then I was like, you know, I was all for it. Yeah. So, so it starts there. So it starts <laughs> almost like you bring in all these different elements into an act of sort of like a really big activist role. Yeah. So where do you go from there? Well, I went to school, I applied to Emerson in Boston because I saw that they were a small media film audio production school. They didn't have all the other junk that I knew I didn't want to partake in. And they were a great school and they also let you design your own major. So I'm going in there like, I want my major to be the music activism quest. <laughs> I literally have the paperwork that says that, okay? 17 years old. Um, they were like, cool. And uh, what it was, was a, it was a triple major. So I combined uh, music production, marketing, and poli-sci. So um, yeah, I, was, I wanted to get a major in music activism. I was so moved by it. And then I started DJing on the radio and that really, 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 really um, blew up eventually on my last year. So let's break it down also. Um, what do you mean by music activism? Using music to send a message. And at 17, I thought I had all the answers, you know. Um, and then as the years went by, I started to travel more. I started to experience a lot of different things. And I learned that I had no answers <laughs> at all. And I'm still there, by the way. <laughs> yeah. So what, what became of that was um, my final major was called music production and social marketing. 
And social marketing is a somewhat new age term for kind of like nonprofit marketing or using marketing for a social message. And so music activism is kind of like that. How do you use music to influence the masses in a, in a positive way? Right. So I'm, I'm, I mean, so here's the subtext that's going in my head also. Mm -hmm. I'm a parent. Uh -huh. And I'm like, okay, and I love my daughter, and whatever she wants to do, How old is she? totally awesome. She's 11. Okay. So we're trying to get her into DJing actually a little bit right yes. now. Let me know. Um, so, um, and I would be open no matter what she did mm -hmm. with her life. If it's her art, like if she jazzes her, rock on. But a lot of parents wouldn't be open to it. I'm mm -hmm. curious, as you're sort of like creating this totally on the fly, mm -hmm. what's the dynamic in terms of like the people around you supporting it? Well, especially then going to college and paying for a degree, which is kind of like, yeah, so I'll give you a quick history. Um, my I come from a biracial uh, parent squad. <laughs> my dad is from Indonesia. My mom is like fourth generation Russian American. Uh, my mom was the rebel marrying a man that wasn't white and that wasn't Jewish because she's also Russian Jewish. So uh, she was kind of the rebel in the family in a lot of ways, and she was the one that was really interested in all different religions and all different um, you know, kinds of music. She raised me on James Brown, Otis Redding, Wilson Pickett, Aretha Franklin. It is like, that's her Bible, right. you know? Um, I have a cassette tape of me singing James Brown at five years old. <laughs> like, awesome. She's so serious about her classic soul. So you have this weird mix, you know? And, um, and my mom is like, you know, like Philly, like her mom is from the Bronx. Her dad is from South Philly. So you have this real kind of like cynical, like hard, you know, no bullshit yeah. type of this side. And then my dad is from the islands and he has like a gazillion friends and you love, everyone loves him the moment they meet him. And he's just got this zen-ness about him. So you got this interesting duo. Uh -huh. um, so already you know that they're open to whatever. And, right. and my mom raised me on like, you're, you, you choose your religion. Like you learn about, the most important thing is you're a good person. You know, that was her bottom line. Um, so maybe that's why, and because of their musical influence, and my dad's a great singer, a great dancer. Um, so with their influence, that's probably where my drive yeah, came from. Yeah, and it from. sounds like they're all totally behind you no matter what you do. Oh, always supportive. Yeah. Yeah. So you get out of, out of college then. Mm -hmm. with this degree and sort yeah. of like, you know, the made, know, up, like, the made up degree. They let me do that? <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. um, and, and then you're thinking to yourself, I'm doing what? So I get the degree and I'm like, I'm going to New York. You know, even, um, even when I was in Philly, I would like sneak into the clubs in Philly and in New York and try to, just for the music experience, you know, like I was always really drawn to music. So um, initially I thought straight from Philly would be New York, but then I found Emerson and I just fell in love with the school. But it was, it was like New York, there was no question New York. And once I got there, I started working at a small production company, which also turned into a small record label. And I did that for two years while DJing in the clubs at night. So I would sleep. I, An hour a day. I would, <laughs> I would, I would get home from work and sleep from like ten to eleven uh -huh. p.m. and then go out from like twelve to four, and then sleep from like you know six to eight. Be at work by like ten. So you're paying your dues. <laughs> Crazy, right? Crazy. So what? I mean, what was driving you at that point? Like, what do you in your mind? Are you working towards something, or mm -hmm. are you just in this whirlwind where? Mm -hmm. Part of it's fun, part of it's insane, and but somehow you right. just it's just you wake up and that's just what you do. Those first two years in New York, I was still figuring it out, which is why I had my hands on everything. And for me, it's like I can only really do what excites me. And I think that's another, I'm, I think my dad would have rather me go and get my master's and run a business because he saw I had, you know, math and managerial skills. But they saw that when I find something that excites me, I just can't, I can't. I'm obsessed, you know, I can't like let go of it. And um, and in New York, I was just going for what was in my field. I had a field in production, I wanted to DJ. And what happened was that after those two years of no sleeping um, and the DJing was picking up and I was starting to learn just how hard it is to DJ in New York and to even keep a weekly party, so to say. But that's when I realized like, hmm, if I put all the energy that I put into this person's company, into my brand, who knows what would happen? 
And I made that decision. And um, that's when I decided, okay, I'm gonna DJ and make music full time. Got some money saved a little bit. And uh, I'm just gonna go all in. Yeah, I mean, it's so interesting because I see that everybody hits this point. I know so many people that are sort of, um, they're doing a couple of different things or they have their main gig that's paying the rent. Mm -hmm. And then they're doing the thing on the side that they really love to do. Right. And, but very few people just make a big jump from one to the other immediately. It's kind of like they're mm -hmm. growing the thing on the side mm -hmm. until it hits a point where they're like, where it, they're good enough and it, they're getting successful enough mm -hmm. that it's, it's showing them the trajectory. Yeah. But they also become really aware of the fact that if they don't go all in, they're never going to get there yeah. or it's going to take a really, really, really long time. So you have mm -hmm. to kind of like make this leap of faith and say, you know what? Let me just put everything that I have into it and see if I can go from here to here radically faster yeah. and go to this place. And that's kind of where the journey begins. Yeah. And the journey is like, ugh, it is such a kick in the ass, you know, because <laughs> yeah. the beginning, for some reason, you always seem to have that beginner's luck. Like my first year of doing it, oh my God, I went on an international tour with a punk rock hip hop band. I was, I won that battle for the crown. I opened up for Rock the Bells, the first female in New York to do that. I was featured on like five MySpace shows. I went on tour with my friend Chuck English from the Cool Kids. Like it was, that first year was just kind of like, you know, I guess the universe was like, yeah, yeah, you should have done this. And then, but then as time went by, like there, there's just plateaus that you're gonna hit and there's obstacles you're gonna hit and to get better and to get smarter is such a, it's such a serious journey, yeah. you know? So let me ask you this then, because you're, mm -hmm. I mean, you're right, there's, there are these plateaus. Mm -hmm. And in your experience, there are a lot, of, I mean, there's so many ideas about how to get through those and it happens to everybody. Even mm -hmm. if you have a big burst, you're gonna hit a point where you're like, huh, things aren't quite working. Mm -hmm. Do you go inside and work on the craft more or do you go outside and work on like the connections and building the business and the relationships or mm -hmm. or for you is it just yes <laughs> yeah it's a mix of both um because i run my own brand you know literally um there's always a balance that i have to have which is probably my hardest trait is keeping the artist side going like the creative side going and then running the business and for me, um, you know, because I, all the income I make is going right back into my business and I'm still in the, in the beginning part, it's hard to know when to turn that off because you're worried about money, you're worried about survival, you're worried about the next step and just be like, no, you are going to write for the next four hours and you're not gonna be, you know, it's, it's really hard for me to balance that actually. Yeah, so how do you do it? I mean, I try to use, I have these like time management sheets that I'm trying to right. work at. Like, so you're basically like test, just testing different methods. Yeah, I'm really yeah. into like holistic stuff and self-help stuff and I've kind of always been and um, it started out with like hippie and now it's going more into like, you know, how to run a business right, right. the right way. But uh, so I'm trying to use methods of people that are gazillionaires and who are doing it right. and like and, and take their advice and use time management try to wake up early try to be a hundred percent consistent every day you know you know and reading the book the war of art i loved it and i hated it reading it because it was like a mirror mm. you know just it was it was just no excuses you have to you know do this 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 and that's i mean it's so interesting too because you know i think so many people would look at it, I, on the one hand, they'll look at, you know, like uh, someone who's in a band or a singer or a songwriter or a composer and be like, oh, that must take a, you know, like school of hard knocks, years and years and years of hard work and they have to pour themselves into the art. And they look at a DJ and they're like, hmm, yeah, I could take a course, <laughs> right, and do that. And then, but when you really get it, you're like, this is astonishing art. I mean, this mm. is craft, this is business, this is, it's so complex. Um, and it's the same, like, if you look at it as, as art and, you know, there are going to be days where you just don't want to show up, you know, but you've got to practice, you've got to learn more, you've got to do the research. Yeah. Um, it sounds like for you also, the, the sort of the cultural anthropology side is, is such a strong vibe through all of it. Yeah, I mean, I can explain it like this. If someone in their life has seen uh, a piece of art in a museum and it just 
kind of changed their life. Maybe they were younger and they saw it. And it, it, it moved them so much that their brain just kind of flipped and they were like, oh, I kind of want to do this. Or it just, it provokes some inspiration, right? Or um, even food that you ate that you remember was like the best meal you ever had, you know? And, it, and then there's probably a night that you went somewhere and heard music and it was one of the best nights of your life, you know? That's where the art element comes into people that have a craft. It's that you make people react so deeply that it becomes a memory that they have for the rest of their life or it changed their life completely. And um, the DJ is a part of that as is a chef, as is a painter, as is, you know, so. Yeah, no, I love that. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's really powerful. I mean, when you can create an experience whatever your medium is right that has that effect right. on somebody that that's magic i mean that's incredible yeah. is that is creating that experience something that's a big part of what drives you yes and it's also therapeutic for me mm, no like way. when i'm performing on stage i just I turn into like a wildebeest, <laughs> like when <laughs> this someone said that to me and i'm like you're totally right um you know, different different forms of the art satisfy different parts of me and make me feel alive. And performing is kind of where I get to like pour it all out. And I just go into this place, I pour it all out, and I, sometimes I can't even see the crowd. I can only kind of feel people because I'm just so in the zone. Whereas DJing, I kind of let their energy come to me. And then we have that conversation. And you know, I've been doing a lot of music curating for fashion shows or stores and stuff. And that is also me. I get, sometimes I'll spend like eight hours delving into the genre of ambient deep house music and mm. study the history of it and, and try to create the perfect playlist for somebody or yeah. their, their place or their brand. And so I love it. I love it. Yeah, so it's this blend of, it's the thing you can't not do, and when you do it on a really high level, mm -hmm. it also changes people. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. Well said. <laughs> so, I, we're going to kind of go over and play with the tables a little bit mm -hmm. in, in a moment, but um, one of the things I always love to ask everybody is the name of this project is called Good Life Project. Mm -hmm. When I ask you, when, when I offer that phrase to live a good life, what comes up for you? Mm. I think of um, doing your art so well that you get paid enough to do what you want. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that would be the good life. <laughs> That's pretty cool. <laughs> so um, so we're gonna now actually uh, jam up from our spot over here uh -huh. and head over just here. By complete fate, there happens to be a set of turntables <laughs> here. Yes. Some other stuff, we're gonna play around a little bit. So okay, we're gonna cool. rejoin you guys in just a second over there. So we are over at the tables now, and uh, this is a <laughs> pretty awesome setup, and Jasmine just spent some time kind of wiring us up. Tell me a little bit about what's actually going on here. Okay. So the main difference between the time that you were DJing yeah. and today is this little guy called the Serato Box. And what happens is normally, this is DJing tutorial 101 with Jasmine Sloan, but normally you'd put vinyl, your turntable would plug directly into the mixer and it would have a master out, which goes into the speakers. Mm -hmm. So kind of like whoop. Right. Now um, we have an interface that's between everything to make everything digital. And so I plug my turntables into the Serato box instead mm. of the mixer. Okay. And then I plug RCAs coming out of the Serato box into the mixer. So what I'm having is I'm having the computer, which has all of my songs, Got it. translate the music into digital grooves, which get um which which go into the digital records these are control records i don't have to change my records these so there's be, nothing on these records there's nothing on these records except digital grooves huh so the music translates through the usb right into the serato box right onto the records i can still you know i can still scratch like oh, that's cool okay so it still seems like Right. It still feels like vinyl. It doesn't so you feel get all exactly the tactile like vinyl. Stuff still going on. Yeah, but it's pretty. It's like ninety-nine percent, and the music is here. Oh, that's awesome. So then, what happens is it goes through the mixer and out, Got and it. so everything is just is just translated digitally. I mean, so on the one hand, it makes it a lot easier, but on the other hand, there's like <laughs> the learning curve 
I mean, there's a whole new sort of like round of technology that you have to learn in there. For sure. So show me a little bit of like... Okay, so you like house. This is a really, this is an edit to a really old house record. I don't know if you'll remember it, but we'll let this play for a second. And then, you know, what I can do is, and also another thing that Serato does is it tells you the VPN. Right, which beats per Which minute. is like so, such cheating for people who, who DJ like in the 80s and 90s. They're like, what are you, you know? But, and so it makes it easy. I can turn down my bass, I can turn up the treble, and I can just blend really well. And even for you, you can kind of watch the waveforms. Right, and so just that's like left they, and right over here? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you're trying to line them up. And then I can turn up the bass, turn it down, and I can even backspin. You know, so it's it, you can you can do it. You can now DJ visually and with your ear. Huh. You remember this? Yeah. So you know, there's just, there's just yeah, endless. Yeah, that's very endless. cool. And of course, we should probably also point out that on you know, like the front of this. Yes. <laughs> You've got your branding, so it's always right you know, like you're rocking the house behind the table, creating your art, but at the same time, mm -hmm. it's all part of a business. You know? yeah. so, so somebody sees that there. Yeah, you could be performing in front of a crowd of you know two to ten thousand people, and probably ninety percent of those people have never heard of you or have never seen you before. Yeah. You know, unless you're Skrillex. And so, how are they going to know who you are? They, if you're up there for a half an hour to two hours and your name is right there, everyone is online, and everyone just Googles you or finds your Twitter immediately and it tweets you, and it's like, oh my God, I know Solano's getting mm. it. And so it's, it's important, uh, every, every detail is important. Yeah, you know? no, I love it. I love the way you blend art and business and treat it um, as if like, you know, there's this craft and this practice that you're mm -hmm. building and, and getting amazing at the same time, mm -hmm. working insanely hard to build a real business around it. Yeah. Um, that's awesome. Anyway, Thanks. thank you so much for sharing. Thank you. This. Kind of bring me back in time a little bit. Very you'll cool. open up. You'll open up for the party. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have you do a house DJ opening set. Uh, I think everyone would run for the hill. <laughs> They're like, get the old dude off the tables. <laughs> No, they wouldn't. They'd be like, oh wow, you brought in like a like a professional here. Right, right, right. Like, yeah. Um, anyway, thank you so much. <laughs> thank I you. Loved hanging out with you. No Great problem. conversation. And uh, Jonathan Fields hanging out here with Jasmine Solano and signing off for a good life project. Mm -hmm.